if time allows, we'll include those. And in order, uh, if you have any technical problems, obviously also use the chat because our back office will be able to contact you and help you along the way. One, one very important thing, and it's the same with every conference and especially with a digital one, timekeeping. I don't enjoy interrupting uh, anyone who has something to say, and I know we all have a lot to say, but this is only two hours now and we have a lot of speakers. So I will always remind you before giving you the floor how much time you actually have. And it would be brilliant if you stuck to the time allotted. Uh, it's in the interest of the conference and in the interest of all the other participants. So thank you very much for your understanding there already. All right. I think that's all the housekeeping you need to know right now. As I said, there's a lot to discuss. So without further ado, let's uh, open day one of uh, the 2020 Inter Resilience Global Partnership Forum with the two co-chairs of the high-level consultative group. That is uh, the Honorable Minister Alfred Alfred Jr. He's the Finance Minister of the Republic of Marshall Island. And of course, the V20 high-level consultative group co-chair. And we'll also hear from Dr. Maria Flaxbart, Parliamentary State Secretary at the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development here in Germany, and the G20 High-Level Consultative Group co-chair. And we start with a video message uh, from Minister Alfred Alfred Jr. So let's listen in. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. To my fellow co-chair, State Secretary Madame Flaxbart, the Insu Resilience High Level Consultative Group, distinguished speakers of today's panel, and all members, and most importantly, colleagues working together under the umbrella of Insu Resilience to deliver financial protection to the poor and the vulnerable. My name is Alfred Alfred Jr. I am the Minister of Finance for the Republic of the Marshall Islands and currently the V20 co-chair of the Partnerships High Level Consultative Group. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our annual partnership forum. This time, not at the usual climate change conference of the UN C, but in the virtual space. This year, the COVID-19 pandemic has confined us all to meet, discuss, and cooperate, not in person, but online. But much worse than that, the current pandemic has put an incredible strain on V20 economies. Simultaneously, riddled by natural hazard, such as typhoon, hurricanes, flooding, our most vulnerable people are put at even more risk. Often forced to seek shelter in evacuation centers in times when social distancing is required. 2020 has been a record breaking year for natural disasters. This is why we must stay on track and update our MDCs by the midnight survival deadline for climate at the end of this year. It is critical that 2020 is seized and not pushed back to 2025 in order to safeguard the 1.5 degree limit and maximize resilience for vulnerable countries. This year, several of our fellow V20 members have also stepped up on the fast track for preaching our debt ceiling. Shrinking economic growth combined with massive emergency spending for health, economic slowdown, and disaster relief has put governments between a rock and a hard place and squeezed public budgets. The COVID-19 crisis has also shed light on the urgency of building resilience to natural hazard and the disasters into which they unfold. Over the past three years, climate-related disasters have cost the world over 650 billion US dollars. We need to accelerate 
adaptation, and resilience building action. Not only through risk finance mechanisms, but through driving investment in preparedness and risk reduction in a way that reaps the double dividend, the triple dividend of increased climate resilience, pandemic response, and economic growth. The solutions we need are solutions which help us to accelerate progress. Proactive investment in risk analysis and risk reduction, including in early warning systems and digital infrastructure, as well as in risk transfer mechanisms, such as social protection, can allow to contribute response and to combine responses to the pandemic and the climate impact, and thus maximize their cost effectiveness in light of scarce resources. In September, at the third AGLCG meeting, the partnership recognized this and made the strategic decision to include pandemic risk into our work. Further, we need to shift public and private finance, including disaster risk finance, to deliver on the Paris Agreement, while mindful of countries' debt sustainability and the pressure the COVID put on everyone's budget. Risk financing needs to be integrated into national adaptation planning in the context of national adaptation plans and nationally determined contributions not only to promote financial protection, but also to capitalize on the co benefit of risk analytics, allowing to price risk and thereby elicit the value of real resilience investment. And premium financing also needs sustainable support, not only because of COVID, but even more so. In 2018, the AGLCG began deliberation on the direct and indirect premium support. In 2020, we furthermore endorsed actions areas to promote the integration of risk finance into national adaptation planning together with members of this partnership. And lastly, we need to look into the kind of solutions that allow us to build progress fast and to achieve our target of 500 million people protected. We need to develop insurance solutions for aggregators, allowing us to reach scale, municipalities, financial institutions, cooperatives, and even businesses. We need robust evidence and insight into what has impact and what has not, and granular risk analytics. And we need cooperation with local partners with boots on the ground and the strengthening of our NGOs, universities, and private sector. We need country ownership to make sure implementation move forward in line with national priorities. As we look to today's session, I am excited to hear from implementation on the ground and the key potentials you'll see to deliver on the objectives of our vision by 2025. My co-chair, State Secretary Flaxbach, is also here to greet you today. And I want to thank her and Germany for the continued leadership on the partnership and support for the V20. Thank you very much, and Kumbh um, Tara. And uh, that was uh, Minister Atrid Atrid there from the Marshall Islands. And uh, he was reminding us again of the urgency of climate risk financing, especially now in times of the pandemic, and especially 
a joint approach, how important that is on local, national, and intergovernmental level. And of course, you already mentioned uh, the uh, high level uh, consultative group co chair, in this case of the G20, Dr. Maria Flaxpart, who's also the parliamentary state secretary at the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And uh, just before I hand over the floor to her, uh, let me remind all those who have just joined us here in this conference to please keep your microphones muted unless you're an active speaker, because there's a lot of interference then and it distorts the sound. So please keep your microphone muted until you speak. And with that, we now would like to hear Dr. Flaxbad speak. Dr. Flaxbad, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Jones, for your introduction, Excellencies, especially my co-chair, Minister Alfred Alfred Jr., Mrs. Steiner, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to all participants at the Interresilience Annual Forum 2020. I'm delighted that we are coming together to take our joint agenda forward. 2020 has shown that we are living in a world of growing uncertainties and compounding risks. COVID-19 has placed an additional burden on vulnerable communities in developing and emerging countries on top of devastating climate change related shocks and disasters. Climate and disaster risk finance and insurance solutions can play a decisive role in safeguarding those communities' hard won development gains and strengthening their resilience. This endeavor drives all of us who have put our combined strength behind the Insure Resilience Global Partnership. We are a vibrant community of 90 members who want to protect 500 million individuals in emerging economies and developing countries by offering pre-arranged risk finance and insurance solutions by 2025, our Insure Resilience Vision 2025. I'm proud of what has already been achieved. Our joint V20 G20 initiative is currently implementing 26 programs in 78 countries. Excellent results for which I would like to thank all partners for their effort. And my co-chair, Minister Alfred, for his guidance and steadfast leadership. At the last meeting of the high-level consultative group in September, we discussed and decided on three strategies directions for the future work of the partnership. First, we decided to drive forward the systematic integration of risk finance into national adaptation planning. For example, into countries' reports of their nationally determined contribution, their NDCs, under the Paris Agreement. Second, the partnership will aim to additionally address pandemic risks in other compound risks when they are connected to climate change related disasters. And third, we endorsed a declaration on gender. I'm looking forward to the upcoming establishment of an inter-resilient center of excellence on gender smart solutions by my esteemed colleague Patricia Fuller, Climate Change Ambassador of Canada and CARE International's Secretary General Sophia Sprechmann Sinairo. I am particularly pleased to see the tripartite agreement flourish. The agreement between UNDP, the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, and the Intro. Um, the Insurance Development Forum, the IDF, advances innovative risk financing solutions as a public-private partnership. Further, the V20 have also driven forward the sustainable insurance facility with the first implementation steps for the Philippines. As for the African risk capacity, the ARC, Member states are already reaping the benefits of the protection offered by drug insurance. Since 2016, 64 million US dollars 
have been transferred to help more than 3.2 million poor and vulnerable people to sustain their livelihoods. In order to help African countries maintain their drug insurance in the face of COVID-19, Germany has subsidized our premium payments for 19 million euros in 2020. As 2020 comes to an end, it is also time to look at the road ahead of us. 2021 will mark a milestone in the global fight against climate change culminating at COP26 in Glasgow, November. We will do our utmost to ensure that the road to COP26 is accompanied by strong delivery on our Vision 2025 targets and a green, resilient recovery with a focus on the poorest and the most vulnerable. Dear participants, I would like to thank all of you for your sustained commitment. Together, we can bring transformational change to enable faster, more effective responses to disaster and climate change related risk. I wish us an enlightening and inspiring annual forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Parliamentary State Secretary Flaxbad there uh, for those introductory words, very upbeat also, that is, uh, uh, is, is very good, especially in these times right now. So thank you so much. And uh, you already mentioned uh, uh, the two next speakers. Uh, before I introduce them, uh, perhaps just uh, a word or two about uh, the issue. Now, as you know, the Insta Resilience Global Partnership is also setting the pace for the integration of gender dimension into climate and disaster risk finance and insurance strategies, as well as uh, approaches there. So in a moment, we will welcome the co-chairs of the gender working group uh, of the INSA Resilience Global Partnership. That is, of course, Patricia Fuller, the ambassador for climate change in Canada, and uh, Sophia Spreckman Sanero, the secretary general of CARE International. But first, uh, let's take a look at the role gender plays in climate and disaster risk response and how the INSU Resilience Global Partnership tackles this challenge with a declaration on gender. So here's a video now. The impacts of climate change and natural hazards on women and men can strongly differ due to existing gender inequalities. Studies show that this is caused by unbalanced power structures, discriminatory laws and customs, and unequal access to and control over resources. So when a disaster strikes, men and women often face different risks, shortages of food, a lack of privacy and safety, and gender-based violence as some of the impacts women tend to be more exposed to in post-disaster contexts. Yet, Countless examples show how reflecting on the social construct of men and women can be an extraordinary asset. In the context of the Hurricane Mitch in Central America, women have been taking an active role in what are traditionally considered male tasks in responding to disasters and have considerably enhanced the resilience of the people. But although the gendered experience plays a major role in the disaster context, what do we really know about it? If women, men and children are impacted differently, wouldn't it make sense to cater for solutions to their needs? As a response, the Insure Resilience Global Partnership at the highest level governing body unanimously endorsed in September 2020 its Declaration on Gender. This signals to the international community the need to recognize and prioritize gender dimensions in the risk finance and insurance sector. To do so, the partnership established a unique platform for coordinating efforts. Welcome to the Center of Excellence on Gender Smart Solutions. Our platform generates and collects the latest research, emerging good practices and effective strategies thereby creating an evidence base by sharing knowledge and expertise easily accessible to all. We also put forward demand-based guidance and develop toolkits to support you in your activities. We create new opportunities. 
By providing information on available scholarships and leadership trainings, we strive to unlock the existing potential across the globe to redress gender issues. Our platform will serve as a focal point of a new worldwide community. This is the place to meet and share your experiences through seminars and events. Together, we can be the agents of change. Join our global platform and harness the extraordinary potential of the gender smart approach to the climate and disaster risk finance and insurance sector. Well, and after uh, this introduction, I would now like to hand over to Patricia Fuller, of course, Climate Change Ambassador in Canada. Patricia, good to have you with us. And uh, I said timekeeping is one of the big challenges of this conference. Your three minutes begin now. Over to you, Patricia. Okay, thank you very much, Monica. And it's a pleasure to participate in the NCU Resilience Global Partnership Forum today with all of you. So there is significant evidence that women and girls are disproportionately and, and differently affected by climate disasters. And these disasters are expected to push an additional 100 million people into extreme poverty by 2030. So that means that more women and girls are now at risk more than ever before, uh, and these can translate into reversed development gains. There's also, uh, as the video uh, signaled, an opportunity to support women in leadership uh, actions to, perp to respond to these disasters. The INSEE Resilience Global Partnership Vision 2025 recognizes the importance of considering gender in climate and disaster risk finance insurance, and gender mainstreaming is one of its two cross-cutting objectives. This year, in the high-level consultative group, we acknowledge the importance of incorporating and integrating gender equality into our work through the Declaration on Gender that we endorsed this past September. The Declaration marks an important milestone for the partnership. It signals to the international community that members of the partnership are dedicated to incorporating gender-responsive approaches in their work. This Centre of Excellence that we're launching today will address gender differ differentiated vulnerabilities through the sharing of experiences, best practices, and resources. It has the potential to transform how gender dimensions are understood, and most critically, how gender is incorporated into the finance and insurance sectors. Among other elements, it will capture research and guidance and work to identify and bridge the data gaps related to women's participation in climate risk insurance schemes. So thank you very much for your attention today. And I will uh, now pass it over to Sophia Speckman Sinero, Secretary General of Care International. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Fuller, for those inspiring remarks. In my role as Secretary General of Care International, it is my pleasure to be part of the soft launch of the Center of the Excellence for Gender Smart Solutions here at the annual forum of the Resilience Global Partnership. The populations of developing countries are most severely affected by climate change and related disasters, and among them, women and children are the ones facing the highest levels of vulnerability. Coming together as a multi-stakeholder cooperation, it is our responsibility to represent those gender differentiated vulnerabilities across all of our activities. That is why CARE has been engaging very actively in the IGP's gender working group, amongst others. Despite the obstacle they face, many of which are intensified by climate change and climate related events, women and girls provide critical solutions to everyday problems as individuals, community members, and as leaders it is therefore crucial to put the spotlight on how to best bundle the multitude of knowledge, resources, and opportunities that is available within the realm of gender and climate and disaster risk finance and insurance, and tap into the potential of women leaders who can transform the sector from within. The Center of Excellence for Gender Smart Solutions provides a very good opportunity to close the exact gap 
and CARE appreciates the efforts to set up a platform which collects, bundles, generates and coordinates information and knowledge on gender related aspects in the area of climate and disaster risk finance and insurance. Most importantly, to make the center of excellence a state of the art platform, it is on us, the members of the INSU Resilience Global Partnership and the Gender Working Group to fill it with life. CARE has already contributed products to the platform, which reflect some of our very concrete program experiences. And we look forward to see the center facilitating sharing best practices and exchange innovative research to populate the platform. Thank you very much for making this partnership what it is. And I'm looking forward to seeing the Center of Excellence for Gender Smart Solutions transforming the activities of the climate and disaster risk finance and insurance community. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sophia Sprechmann Zanero there, and uh, Patricia Fuller, of course, and for this soft launch of the uh, Center of uh, Excellence for uh, well, Gender Smart Solutions. All the best for that, uh, a great idea, and uh, I'm sure it'll be very successful. Thank you much for this contribution. Well, we move on now in this uh, short first day session, uh, to where we focus on uh, country presentations uh, within the Inter-Resilience Global Partnership. Uh, we will definitely hear from Peru, that is already uh, confirmed. We are also trying to get hold of uh, Mozambique. I know that they're trying uh, to join this conference. I think there are some technical issues right now, uh, but uh, there is always hope. So let's first of all cross over now to Peru, where Eduardo Moron, uh, president of the Peruvian Association of Insurance Companies, is uh, standing by uh, and uh, his presentation. So we're looking forward to this now. Eduardo, the floor is yours. Monica, if somebody can help me with the, with the slides, I will really appreciate it. Um, so uh, as soon as the slides are going to show, uh, you are going to see why we are doing this. Uh, basically, we have a triple combination of, uh, uh, of issues that we, that we have to uh, uh, tackle in this uh, program. Uh, first, we have a, 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 a high exposure to severe disasters. We have, uh, could you put next, please? Uh, we have uh, earthquakes and uh, floodings uh, coming from El Nino. Um, basically, our approach to these uh, uh, severe disasters has been um, not having enough money to uh, uh, respond uh, to them. So uh, one of the things that we have been doing as a country in the last uh, uh, 50 years is to increase our fiscal policy uh, readiness uh, to, to improve the way that we uh, uh, provide relief a reconstruction or rehabilitation of uh, under these uh, uh, extreme scenarios. That actually has happened. We have uh, improved substantially our uh, readiness uh, from the fiscal point uh, of view, but still uh, uh, our uh, uh, current standpoint is that we do not have the ability to respond uh, adequately to, uh, to one of these uh, uh, crises. The next one, please. And we, well, I'm going to jump a little bit uh, given the, the time limit. Uh, as I said, we have uh, uh, quakes and, 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 and El Nino coming from uh, all, uh, all over the place. Next one, please. And our, uh, and our basic uh, uh, response to many of these disasters has been not reconstructing even uh, 40 years on. Uh, many of these uh, 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 infrastructures have not been reconstructed uh, yet. Uh, next one, please. Uh, as I said, uh, the, the main uh, effort uh, from uh, uh, the point of view of Peru has been to uh, uh, strengthen the fiscal response. So uh, basically what, what, what have been done in these years is, uh, is a, a, a many things. Uh, the first one is to have more uh, fi uh, financial instruments to respond to prices. So now we have a, a reserve fund for uh, contingencies. We have a fiscal stabilization fund. We have contracted uh, uh, credit contingent lines. 
we even, uh, uh, with the help of the World Bank, uh, we have now a small uh, uh, catastrophe bond. Uh, but the missing part of this uh, uh, financial strategy is that we do not have until now uh, an insurance mechanisms uh, uh, to, 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 to help us to have enough funds if we have uh, a significant disaster. Uh, most of our public assets, you can call roads, hospitals, or uh, schools, most of them are not insured. Uh, so anytime we, go, we get hit by a, a, a disaster, there is no insurance solution uh, coming uh, uh, in response. Uh, we have also uh, improved now, now we have a, a specific guidelines for, for PPP uh, infrastructure. And now we have a, a, an institution that's supposed to be the, a, a permanent one taking care of the, of the reconstruction effort. The next one, please. Uh, we have, we have uh, put a lot of emphasis on the, on the emergency relief uh, part of the, of, uh, of the aftermath of a disaster, but not uh, enough uh, effort on the rehabilitation and reconstruction effort. Uh, as I said, we do not have the capacity to, to an speedy uh, damage assessment. For example, in the last El Nino, uh, we spent two years uh, just assessing the damage uh, to all the infrastructure that was uh, done. Until we do not uh, complete that, we cannot start the reconstruction process. So as you can say, uh, as you can imagine, we have the money, but we do not can we cannot use that money to start the reconstruction effort. There are no predefined rules for reconstruction uh, uh, for a reconstruction building process. We do not have a, a complete database uh, uh, of public assets. We do not have uh, any clarity with respect to what is going to be put uh, 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 instead of of the infrastructure that has been damaged. So there are plenty of, of, uh, of uh, tasks to be uh, done. And we have the choice to choose uh, 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 where to put our effort uh, as, a, as a project. And we decide to, instead of using roads or hospitals, we decide to go to the uh, schools, to public schools. Could you please help me with the next one, please? And, and the reason uh, of uh, going to schools actually was the, that we were lucky that the Minister of Education conduct a, a, a complete census of all uh, almost 60,000 uh, uh, schools that are across the country. So that gave us uh, uh, enough information to start with the process of, uh, of preparing this, uh, this project. And as I said, the last El Nino show us the, the importance of this uh, type of, uh, of solution because we had already the money, but we were not able to, pr to provide a, a proper solution to the, to the problem. Uh, none of the, of the 1,000 schools that were damaged in El Nino has been re rebuilt uh, right now, uh, even that, uh, that happened four years ago. Next one, please. To give you uh, an idea of the of the project, uh, you will see here uh, all the, the people that are involved. We have many uh, uh, the, the reinsurers that are given the, the, the capabilities to prepare this project. We have uh, a very tech uh, uh, solutions. One that is key for this project to shorten the, the, the amount of time that we can uh, provide the schools is uh, this insure tech called a uh, picture because that is going to allow us to have a, a very rapid assessment of, of the damage and there and therefore we will be able to provide uh, um, to speed up the process of, uh, of reconstruction and of course uh, there is the government uh, right there so uh, as you can see there is a this is a a, a very complex uh, um, a, a project but we are hope that this is going to be a, a much better solution a solution for the uh, severe disasters in peru thank you very much Well, thank you so much, uh, Eduardo Moron, there for uh, presenting your experience there for the Peruvian Association of Insurance Companies. Uh, very interesting. And also, thank you so much for keeping to the time. Uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the chat on the side here, uh, being informed that uh, our guest from Mozambique uh, was in the call. Then we lost him again. 
Uh, so I'm just pricking my ears now to see if Antonio Kefas uh, from Mozambique is in the call. If so, then please make yourself heard. But it doesn't doesn't look good. So we've 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 lost Mozambique. It seems. Um, if he joins us later again, maybe we can fit him in there. I see the, the chart now. Uh, so again, Antonio Kefas there, uh, coordinator of the Risk Management and Resilience Program at the National Institute for Disaster Management in Mozambique. Are you with us? Uh, if so, I would like to give you the floor for six minutes now. Uh, please get started. Activate your microphone and uh, share your experience with us, please. All right, I could, I could hear you breathe, but I couldn't hear more. So again, Antonio Kefas, please talk to us. Now, we do have, we do have this little buffer, but I'd rather move on to the next uh, part of the session now. Uh, Antonio, if you're having trouble, keep trying, we might come back to you. Instead, I would like now to move on to our high-level panel because I know that we have six uh, uh, panelists. Uh, it's a real stellar panel and they all have a lot to say. So even if we have a couple of minutes longer, I don't think it will do any harm. So. Um, in this panel, we will also obviously keep in mind the uh, tripartite agreement, which was launched uh, in uh, September last year at the UN summit. Uh, and of course, uh, we'll also keep an eye on the work of GRIF, which is part of the INSA Resilience Program Alliance. And I'm very happy to welcome now Eduardo Moron, who was uh, just talking to us, president uh, of the Peruvian Association of Insurance Companies, I'm also happy, and I hopefully they're, they're all here, uh, to welcome Abu Bokari Kokofele, Commissioner at the National Commission for Social Action in Sierra Leone. Uh, and everyone who I uh, just uh, speak to, you can just briefly activate your microphone and your video so that I know that you're here. Then I would also like to welcome Achim Steiner, the Administrator of the United Nations Development Programme. Denis Duvern, and I can see him already. Yes, hello. <laughs> Chairperson of the Board of Directors of AXA and Chairman of the Insurance Development Forum. I also welcome Asami Nagui Baba, Global Director for Urban Disaster Risk Management, Resilience and Land Global Practice at the World Bank. And last but not least, there you are, I can see Abu Kukufele, yeah. And uh, Jürgen Sattler, Director General Global Issues at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. So this should be the entire panel. And we have uh, roughly 40 minutes, six panelists, hopefully, uh, and a lot to discuss. So uh, we have several rounds of questions and also our participants, everybody who's joining is invited to, to submit questions in the chat. Uh, so let's try to keep the first round, uh, the answers down to about three minutes that will allow us also to uh, engage with each other and certainly have a second round. And I would like to start with you, uh, Abu Kokofele. So uh, please tell me, in, when there is a major disaster, climate shock, pandemics, uh, you name it, what instruments are in place? What instruments are you actually working on to address people's needs? Abu Kokofele, if you would like to answer that question now. Thank you. <clears throat> Social protection is most often thought as an instrument for long-term poverty reduction and human capital accumulation and has only recently been viewed as an important risk management instrument. In Sierra Leone, social protection has been an instrument for addressing vulnerability to shocks from its inception. Indeed, the social protection, the social safety net program is the main instrument that the government of Sierra Leone has in its toolbox 
for addressing people's needs after shocks. It provides a pre-existing system that allows us to uh, identify and provide support to affected households. However, COVID-19 highlighted that we have gaps in social protection coverage. For example, the cash transfer is predominantly operating in rural areas, but the pandemic hit informal sectors, uh, sector workers in urban areas first and hardest who were out of each of the existing interventions. The first lesson from this shock and the ones before it is the it is to invest in expanding the fundamental foundational uh, safety net program and strengthen its underlying delivery systems, extending access to more poor and vulnerable households. So did you just stop in the middle of a sentence? Do you want to pick it up from there, or shall we move on? Uh, because I'll be coming back to you I, definitely. I, I, I just I just pick it up from there. Okay about the first lesson we learned from the shock from this current uh, recent uh, shock and uh, once before this um, um, to invest in expanding the foundational safety net program and strengthening its underlying uh, delivery systems extending access to more poor and vulnerable households who are the most vulnerable to shocks this means that more people are more easily reached with assistance, providing a stronger platform for mobilizing shock response. The second lesson is that from the strong foundation, there is a need to invest in the specific capabilities and the preparedness measures that can make social protection more responsive to major disasters, including through linkages to early warning systems, pre-registration of vulnerable households, and flexible program delivery systems for rapid targeting payment after a shock. The global, um, the GRIF financing is helping us to, to do all of these things going forward. Last but not least, COVID-19 showed how important it is to have financial uh, resources ready to disburse after a shock has hit, to help us respond quickly. But equally, it is clear how, how quickly those resources can be overwhelmed by a major shock like uh, COVID-19, uh, meaning that a major shock if you have a limited like uh, 4 million US dollars, which you kept aside, COVID-19 was such a big pandemic that it overran the resources we had. Right. I would like to move on to the next panelist now. So hold your thought there. Ideally, thank you, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this. Uh, I would like, just like uh, to briefly go back to Eduardo uh, Moron uh, and, and ask him why the Peruvian Association of Insurance Companies and the government actually decided to engage with the IDF on the uh, tripartite uh, agreement. Uh, what's that the project focused on? Why did they do it? So Eduardo Moron, if you're still here, uh, if you could answer that in three minutes, I'd be very much obliged. No problem, Monica. Uh, uh, one thing that is uh, is kind of uh, obvious, probably for all of us uh, insurers, but it's not obvious for the government, is what is the price for all uh, uh, this type of insurance? They do not know if this is going to cost a, a, a huge sum that is impossible to pay, or is something actually reasonable, okay? And this is a first uh, uh, barrier that is very important to have uh, uh, all the IDF, IDF uh, on the back to be uh, uh, to have a, a, a much stronger uh, uh, answer to that uh, very simple question from the Minister of Finance. 
is. This is going to cost me how much, okay? So they need to know that this is not, you are not buying a, a, a rocket uh, uh, to go into space. This is something that is actually affordable to government. Um, and they need uh, not just the local insurers to have that answer, but actually uh, they need to have whoever is going to actually be providing the, the, the reinsuring power uh, behind this insurance uh, uh, solution. So this is something that is quite important. The second uh, reason to have uh, uh, all this uh, group together uh, is quite important is that actually uh, this is going to be a very complex process. Uh, you are going to need uh, a lot of uh, uh, capabilities, technical capabilities, to provide uh, the right insurance uh, uh, solution. And it's not going to be, as I said in my presentation, it's not going to be just a, an insurance solution. It's going to have a lot of other components that are actually going to improve the standard insurance solution that is just give money if you have a disaster. Here, the most important, the most crucial uh, 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 question for the government is, can you shorten the time of reconstruction? Or yes or no? If you cannot do that, I don't want your insurance solution. Okay, so that is why we have to have all these uh, technical capabilities coming from the agreement uh, to have a much better uh, answer to the government. Thank you, Monica. Well, thank you so much, uh, Eduardo there. Um, moving on to Achim Steiner, who I can also see, that always makes me feel good when I can actually see you. Um, obviously, the Administrator of the United Nations Development Program. Good to have you with us. So, can you tell us what lessons can be learned following the unique collaboration that you're involved in under the tripartite agreement? And I do have a terrible feedback, so in case somebody's got the microphone open, other than me and Achim, please mute. And it's now over to Achim Steiner. Thank you very much, Morgan. Well, it's a great pleasure to, to join you. And um, let me begin by quickly just making a reference to, to the moment in time in which we are meeting, and we are focusing on climate and disaster risk finance, but we are meeting in the midst of COVID, and I think four words <clears throat> in many ways amplify what we set out in this tripartite agreement and in the, in the aspiration to try and address the issue of financing. The one we made a very good point just now, we are not trying to send a rocket to the moon, we are trying to deal with two very simple lessons we have learned from history. One is, the relationship between vulnerability and resilience, and secondly, falling into crisis by, de by, design, by default or dealing with them by design. And I think these are, to me, the two, let's say, core ideas that underpin the very intense collaboration that we have initiated with the Tripartite Agreement and also with the Insurance Development Forum. Uh, Denis is here also, and many of our colleagues with whom we are working in the Insure Resilience Global Partnership. And at the heart of that is really to recognize that, first of all, uh, vulnerability uh, in this COVID crisis is so clearly demonstrated. If people have no um, protection, if they have no insurance in the larger sense of the word, if they have no safety net on which to rely on, it is a disaster. It is an economic freefall. And the irony of a virus that needs to be contained at the same time driving people to hunger is by extension the same logic we have to deal with when we have extreme weather events, hurricanes, small island developing states, economies essentially having 10, 20, 30 percent of their national infrastructure wiped out. And I think it is against this backdrop that our collaboration is so critical because clearly, first of all, we have to recognize that physical vulnerability translates also into economic vulnerability and the ability to absorb what will be inevitable realities in a world beset by climate change is extreme weather events, is all the things that we're familiar with. We have embarked as a development organization, UNDP, for the past two to three years, very deliberately in working closer with the world of insurance because one, understanding risks, secondly, finding solutions in which mutuality, the collective ability to act, to spread risk and thereby create also a commensurate um, scale of response that does not ruin the national budget uh, is clearly a key objective. And in the way that I think we are proceeding right now, I'm very encouraged because, first of all, the collaboration in the tripartite agreement is very good. We have continued, despite COVID-19, on identifying the 20 countries we have committed to. We have seven essentially on the road, uh, despite all the challenges this year, and eight one I think almost there. 
And we are well on track to, I hope, uh, meeting that ambition we set ourselves to find a new platform for partnership to incubate, to innovate. Um, let me also say that in looking at risk financing, one thing is to try and bring different capacities together. The second is to focus on crisis, but really as a development organization, our objective is always to build for the long haul, to invest in the ability of countries to have that capacity, to have systems that are within, first of all, their own control and domain, but are linked to the best practice that a world of both insurance as, a, um, as an industry, but also in terms of the regulatory frameworks, because much of what would or would not happen is in part predicated on how governments create the regulatory frameworks, the incentives, the kinds of, um, let's say, policy infrastructure that we need in order for this partnership to truly leverage. So from my perspective, um, I think we obviously are in a very, very difficult situation. But in a strange sort of way, the reality of COVID has made it even more obvious why this tripartite agreement and the kind of work we're trying to catalyze and foster is in fact so valuable. And to the Minister of Finance, um, who looks beyond one or two or three years, this is perhaps the best investment and risk management tool we could provide to them. So back to you, Monica. Thank you.